Welcome to Love, Loss and Laundry, a virtual performance by Toronto author Darlene Madot. I would kindly ask you to remain muted throughout the whole event. Please note that this event is being recorded and will be posted on YouTube and shared on social media. My name is Licha Canton and I am pleased to be your host today. Darlene will perform excerpts from her experimental work, Dying Times. Translator Maria Pia Spadafora will be reading a short excerpt of Darlene's writing in Italian. We are all in different territories at this time. Darlene Madot is in Toronto. Maria Pia Spadafora is in Milano, Italy. I would like to acknowledge that I am located on unceded indigenous lands. Jojage, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. We acknowledge them and other First Nations who care for the land across our country, and we recognize them as Canada's first storytellers. Feel free to type in questions using the chat function on your screen at any time. Send your questions to the host. I will read the questions during the question and answer period at the very end. Send any other comments or any issues, any technical difficulties to the co-host. To watch Darlene's performance, choose speaker view at the top right hand corner of your screen. Again, please remain muted during the whole event. It is now my great pleasure to introduce Darlene Madot. Darlene Madot is an award-winning writer who practiced law in Toronto for more than 35 years. Author of a growing collection of books, her short fiction has garnered literary awards, including the title story of her seventh book, Making Olives and Other Family Secrets, Ripasso. Her collection of linked short stories, Stations of the Heart, Exile Editions, again won the Bersani Literary Award and included Vivi's Florentine Scarf, winner of the Paolucci Prize of the Italian American Writers Association. She has had three short stories shortlisted for the Gloria Vanderbilt sponsored Carter V. Cooper Exile Competition. Dying Times, which is forthcoming with Exile in 2021, excerpts from which Darlene performs today, is a fictional exploration of last journeys. It is also my pleasure to introduce Maria Pia Spadafora. A native of Calabria, Maria Pia Spadafora is a freelance translator, creative writer, and tutor of Italian, English, and Spanish. She holds a master's in modern languages and literature from the University of Calabria, presenting as a final dissertation, the translation and analysis of Licia Canton's The Pink House and other stories. In April, 2020, she translated from Spanish to Italian, the, the story of the short film nominated for Premio Goya 2020, Laura Zamora's El Arbol de las Almas Perdidas published on Amazon Kindle. Maria Pia is currently working on a short story translation written by Darlene Madot. She now lives and works in Milan. And now we are eager to hear Darlene Madot's Dying Times. Darlene? Earth times are to be treasured and this is the first time I'm connecting with you in this way. This is the first time I appear before you naked on a very intimate subject. And this is the first time I'll be showing you my underwear. This is my first pandemic. So um, I'm celebrating you for your first times and I'm asking that you join the conversation at the end through the chat and to please ask questions. Questions are the only way I have ever learned anything. And I've always believed they're more important than the answers. When Maria Pia Spadafora performs her translation of Laundry, an excerpt from Dying Times, you'll hear the words la sua scomparsa, disappearance, not morte. The word morte, Maria Pia Spadafora tells me, frightens Italians. It frightens everyone. 
and I think it's the reason death must be faced dead on. So we have a choice to sing or stut the zit. <laughs> and I think we have plenty of time to be silent underground. So here goes. My mother is dying. My senior partner, Jack, is dying. Our richest client, Bernie Sperling, is dying, each taking their own sweet times, defying predictions. They say my mother has maybe three weeks to live. She's not dying fast enough for Jack. He says he needs me to interview witnesses and wants Bernie's trial fast track to happen before the first day of spring. He says this is because he's got maybe six months to live. Bernie, our quadriplegic client, confined to a wheelchair, wants his case done and gone before his wife can get her hands on his money. Not one effing cent. I'm taking their deaths into me. There's no way out of any of this. I'm the goldfish in the bowl in my childhood home. The fish flashed about over glittering blue crystals we didn't know were lethal. My mother had bought these crystals at the dollar store, thinking they would liven up the goldfish's confined universe. How that fish flailed about. I thought it was play until I understood it to be fish language for dying. Dying had been the fight of its life. Love. More than the greatest love the world has known, this is the love I give to you alone. My life will be in your keeping, waking, sleeping, laughing, weeping. Bobby Darren. Their life in each other's keeping lasted 67 years. Until my father's death at 87, Mum had never been alone a day in her life. Her attempts to learn at 87 how to be a widow endured three years. My favorite bedtime story, whether it was dad tucking us into bed or mum, was the story of how they met. According to both, it was love at first sight. Mum had gone to a Toronto dance hall, Sunnyside, with her sister Sophia. The story, however, was about the car ride home. Dad's friend Mario was driving because he owned the car. Giovanni was in the back seat with Francesca. With every turn in the road, Giovanni leaned into her. He was in the back seat with her. She felt a shock go through her, a warm thrill. Too shy to speak, they sat in silence. In Mum's story, Dad called her at 7.30 the next morning. She was so shy, afraid of my shadow that she put her sister Sophia on the phone to carry on the conversation. She was only 16. In dad's story, it was 9.30 in the morning. 7.30 would not have been respectful. He was 23 and said he thought about such things. He said she must have waited beside the phone for two hours. War came, dad enlisted. He was stationed at the Canadian National Exhibition Grounds in Toronto. Through weeks and months, he didn't contact Francesca. By his story, he didn't want to start something that would have to be broken off. My mother, however, had learned he was there and she took his silence as a sign. She was so heartsick with loss that her hair began to fall out. She pined for him, she mourned him. But they found each other again and a wartime correspondence ensued and even a recording of his voice reading a letter to his beloved yearning to be with her and photographs of dad training on the mountains out west and Whistler and more and more letters from the time dad was stationed in Port Alberni. He never did go overseas. Ch uh, challenged by the English officers who were trying to shame enlisted men into signing up for active duty, one demanded to know what will you tell your grandchildren? My father said, I will have grandchildren. Francesca and Giovanni married in Toronto during the war. Immediately following the wedding on dad's brief furlough, they went to Niagara Falls for their honeymoon. Mum was gorgeous 
and dad was a champion weightlifter with the hands of an artist. The newlyweds attracted so much attention in Niagara Falls that dad, although he had papers permitting him to wear civilian clothing, had to put his uniform back on. Who's the Dane? A group of sailors taunted. My wife, and don't you dare disrespect her with your filthy stares. Mom was so shy, such an innocent, she hid behind a bureau on their wedding night. I was just plain, she said, when I reminded her of the story. He was so warm. When he put his arms around me, he was always so warm. She was protected throughout the whole of their lives together, right to the end. And then she found herself alone with no one to prepare a table in the presence of her enemies. In the beautiful intimacies of their life together, she had found a freedom, but it was a freedom that sometimes filled her with a fear of those intimacies, a fear that such intense intimacies could only lead to pain, to an inevitable sense of horrible loss. And now that she was gone, she said she understood that he was gone, far beyond the pains and joys of their life together, beyond their intimacies and that fear. He was gone into another kind of freedom where in her own death, she would never find him. Together in dying, but never in death. Laundry. My mother did not think I should waste my younger years learning how to do laundry. All the time I studied the piano, learned to be a lawyer, and married my husband, my mother did my laundry. Zachary figured out long before I did, this was her link to me, a guarantee that she would see me at least once a week. Every now and then, Zachary would slip his boys in with my ladies. And they'd come back from my mother, pressed and in a separate bag. He thought this hilarious. And it was, it was also belittling my mother's work. There is a white summer sweater I gave my mother to wash toward the end of her final summer. It wasn't that I couldn't do it, do it myself. My mother had taught me how to roll the gently washed sweater in a towel, twist the towel to squeeze out the water without disturbing the delicate sequins and pearl buttons, how to block the sweater out on the clothes horse, how to make everything smell sweet. I gave her this sweater so that she could do for me what only a mother can do for her daughter, a form of communion. As I wear the fresh sweater the summer after her death, she is alive in the folds, the smell of her sweet handiwork wrapped like a gift in tissue paper. Il bucato. Mia madre non voleva che sprecassi gli anni della mia giovinezza a imparare a fare il bucato. Per tutto il tempo trascorso a studiare pianoforte, imparare a fare l'avvocato e sposare mio marito, era lei che faceva il mio bucato. Zaccari capì molto prima di me che questo era il nostro legame, una garanzia per vedermi almeno una volta alla settimana. Ogni tanto Zaccari infilava i suoi ragazzi con le mie signorine. E ritornavano a casa stirati e in un sacchetto a parte. Pensava che fosse silarante e lo era. Era anche sminuire il lavoro di mia madre. C'è un maglione bianco estivo che ho dato a mia madre da lavare verso la fine della sua ultima estate. Non che non potessi farlo io stesso. Mia madre mi aveva insegnato a far rotolare il maglioncino delicatamente lavato in un asciugamano a girare l'asciugamano per strizzare l'acqua senza scompigliare le delicate paillettes e i bottoni di perle, a bloccarlo nello stento di biancherie e a rendere tutto più profumato. 
le ho dato questo maglioncino perché potesse fare per me quello che solo una madre può fare per una figlia, una forma di comunione. Quando indosso il maglioncino fresco, l'estate dopo la sua scomparsa, lei è viva nelle pieghe. Il profumo del suo dolce lavoro avvolto come un regalo in cartavelina. Graveyard humor. There were two moments of unexpected laughter. I had forgotten to place a paintbrush in my father's casket. Knowing how distressed I was, my son Marco suggested I bury a paintbrush in the earth over his grave. The only soil I could move with my bare hands was at the foot of the stone. I pulled back the sod and buried one of dad's paintbrushes. Later in the spring at Holy Week, Rose dug up the sod to plant perennials. She uncovered the brush. She never thought to tell me. A week later, She came back with a bouquet of brushes. She, she planted these upright so that whoever had planted the original brush might wonder at its miraculous propagation. The second laugh came at Easter when Rose, as she tended dad's grave and that of her late husband, Carl, noticed another Malati stone close by our father's plot. She was amazed to see that it belonged to our very alive older sister, Elizabeth Malati McPhee, and her husband, Louis McPhee. Elizabeth's name and Louis's name were carved into the stone that lacked only their death dates. Rose, going to the nearest dollar store, bought a wind-propelled roadrunner and some plastic fuchsia roses. She put the roses on top of the stone Catholic cemeteries must have removed the roadrunner. When we all visited the graveyard with mom, fortunately Rose gave mom the heads up. Elizabeth cried, someone left roses on my grave. That's nice, mom said, but don't you think it's a bit premature? Who'll tend to my grave when I'm gone? Elizabeth said, no one will ever do for me what I've done for you. When I die, Louis said, I'm going out in the biggest badass honking coffin money can buy. Booze for my friends, Led Zeppelin and Frank Sinatra singing, I did it my way. I dream everyone dies. The client Bernie Sperling, Bernie's soon to be former wife, my senior partner, Jack. Me. Death seems to be the only way to escape the burden of this case. The 33 years of Bernie's marriage. I'm filled with panic. I've been given to panic all my life. In our early years, Jack had taken me aside and made me count to 10, made me breathe deeply. Now, take that formidable brain of yours and apply it to this case. What I love about you is your passion for my case, Bernie says to me in front of Jack. You've got to be effing kidding, I think. Jack pulls a face. You don't have to be passionate about something to be an effective professional, he tells me. You just have to stay grounded. It only takes one lawyer with brilliance to conclude a file. My passion. I don't have passion. I have tenacity. I'm a fraud. Jack knows this. I hate Bernie, never more than when he displays vindictive avarice or says he loves anything about me. And I hate how he selects people to employ, defective people no one else will hire, like his controller who has a stutter and a limp, knowing that their handicaps keep them bound to him that they work themselves to the bone for him, and knowing that they actually seem to give a shit about what happens to him. Like I too, being honest, actually care about Bernie, especially when he asks me about my dying mother. Yet I hate him. He has me flailing about in tortured confusing, confusion. And it bothers Jack that Bernie seems to have affection for me. 
It is odd that Jax should be so possessive about this one client when he has never been with any of our others. I am here on this case, passion or not, to serve. Without question, pretending never to be confused, Jack hates it when I ask questions. I've regressed 30 years. I'm again filled with doubt, self-doubt, like a junior lawyer. If you can't think now, what will you do when I'm dead? I think Jack likes the shock value of the word dead. Maybe saying dead somehow objectifies the imminent reality. Dying, dead, death, dead as a doornail, done like dinner, dead right, dead wrong, dead end, dead lying, dead as a doornail. What's a doornail? What will you do when I'm dead? I will have frequent consultations with you, Jack. You'll get no peace, no rest where you're going. I'll keep asking myself, what would Jack do in this situation? And so I will ask, I will hound you unto death. I think you're going a little crazy. You'll never be able to think like Jack. We both laugh. Don't know that I want to. There will only be one Jack. Never be another Jack. Never, ever again in this lifetime, in any time. White eyes. Jack has summoned me into his office. He has requested this document or that. We are preparing for questioning Bernie's wife. I brought Jack what he wants and he makes another request and then another and I'm about to rush off to fetch what he wants when he tells me not so fast. Sit down. He's eating a pear. The juicy flesh of it fills his mouth. He eats inward, tasting every bit of it, the juice running down his chin, which he ignores as if he has lost feeling or doesn't care anymore. I smile and about to giggle like some silly schoolgirl when he says, what? He's smiling too. And we're both children again. I blurt out, I'm busting to have a pee, Jack, if you must know, but you take first priority, Jack, as always. And he instructs me, no, go. I don't want you to be in pain. I can wait. Which is a real first. I'll be quick. And when I come back, we're both giddy with the reality of what is finally happening. These cross examinations of Bernie and his wife marching toward the trial. He is asking questions out loud. Do you want me to take notes, Jack? No, he says, and I feel useless. Then I realize I'm a necessary audience. He tells me the cancer has metastasized. It is now throughout my liver and beyond. I wince. I'll not live long enough to benefit from the cancer cures that will likely be uncovered within the next five years. I'm happy. That's natural. It holds no terrors for me. He tells me what he needs me to do. The junior and articling students are all running this way and that. And then he tells me he feels he must resign from the file. I do what I have to do. There's one last story he needs to tell me. It's about his mother's secret. He says he had actually written the story down as if it were fiction. He has called the story Miriam's secret. He says the cleaning lady or someone in the house has thrown it out. The story is his father David had deserted his mother Miriam in the first year of their marriage. His mother's sisters had asked, was the problem there, signifying the bedroom? Her husband's abandonment must have devastated Jack's mother. In those days, no one divorced. David didn't like the grocery business, his mother told her sisters. They were dumbfounded. Each of them had a grocery store. 
it supported their families. They didn't have a boss. How could someone not want to work in a grocery store? Getting Miriam's husband established in the grocery business had been the family's wedding gift to them. Miriam's sisters, drained of their anger, took pity on Miriam and hugged her. Poor baby, don't worry, he'll come back. 10 months later, when my mother returned home from work, she walked upstairs into the kitchen and there was my father sitting at the table, looking proud of himself. He looked at my mother Miriam, smiled and told her, I have found a job, I've got a trade. I was born nine months later. Jack asked me if I could find a place once he'd written it down again to publish the story. That's what he wanted. The story was the truth. It was fiction, but it was the truth. I was astonished. Because it was fiction, Jack knew it was somehow bigger. This from a man who hated untruth tellers. When this examination of Bernie's wife is over, I said, say the word and I'll be there morning or night. I will be your scribe, help you get any of your stories down. There are so many. He doesn't say too many. I realize I may in fact have given him something. I may have given him a glimpse of life beyond death, his story told. This is short-lived. Within moments of my leaving his office, he calls me back. He looks directly at me. I cannot read his expression. It is a poker face. I notice his white eyes, not the living white wolf eyes of a few weeks back. Jack's eyes were normally blue, but this is an almost metallic white. Is it the drugs? Is it some mineral chemical compound that is burning them white? He hands me the index to some brief he will need for tomorrow. He needs to have it sent out for photocopying. There's a long silence. He is not without fear. The dark. Daddy, I have to go the pee pee. Elizabeth's voice called out in the dark. Three years ahead of me, she had to be at least five. Rose was not yet born. I wore pajamas with a back flap. I crawled over the rails of the crib and backed up to dad whenever I had to go pee during the night. So possibly I was two years old and a bit. I was deeply resentful of the flap. I wanted pajama bottoms. I could pull down without having to wait for dad to find my buttons in the dark. Her voice would continue to rise transposition of a half note. Daddy, I have to go the pee pee. And then descend a minor third on the second D of daddy, raise a minor third for the balance of the phrase, then descend the minor third on the second P of pee pee, transpose up half a note and repeat louder and louder. Daddy, I have to go the pee pee. I figured out this about transpositions later, of course, when I'd begun to study music, but at two and a half or three, I wondered at around the third sing-song transposition, what was taking him so long to respond? Enough to shout out angrily in staccato, Daddy, she has to go the baby. And our daddy would finally come to take Elizabeth down the short hallway to the bathroom where he'd sit on the edge of the tub, and when she had done her pee-pee, escort her back to bed. Without fear of the dark myself, I began to wonder if my older sister was onto something. How to get her father's close attention? In fear, I began to learn fear. Dust. Remember you come from dust 
and to dust you shall return. The imposition of ashes, Ash Wednesday. The interiors of her homes were meticulous, cared for. The expression, you can eat off her floors, was made for my mother. One of her projects for the apartment where we lived above my father's sign shop was to remove the yellowed wax from the linoleum floor of the rec room. When my father expanded the sign shop to accommodate transport trucks that entered through a huge garage door, the expansion gave our family a recreation room and mom got a laundry. This freed her from having to take our laundry to a machine inside the sign shop where customers would ogle her young figure in her house dress. Because of her constant waxing and polishing over the years, the linoleum of the rec room had yellowed. She decided to attack it. As I practiced the piano, Mum was on her hands and knees. I vowed, never me, never me, never on my knees. Mum soaked the squares in solvent and then scraped each square with a paring knife until the linoleum regained its luster. She never asked her daughters for help. She thought we had better things to do with our lives. The floor looked awful at first, being two-toned. But once she'd started, there was no going back. The complete cleaning took her about a year. On Sunday nights, our mom sat on the long yellow vinyl couch watching Bonanza and the Ed Sullivan Show in black and white while she worked on the floor. Come watch, Dad would coax. Aren't you even going to sit down? I can hear it, Mom would answer as she attacked the floor. By Christmas, she'd worked through half the squares, edging backward crab-like, crossing in front of how the Grinch stole Christmas. It seemed futile, one square at a time, and yet she got it done, achieving a dignity underfoot. I inherited my mum's discipline, her tenacity, a gift given in the blood. Elizabeth turned the same gift into bloody-mindedness, a sometimes mendacious manipulation of others, Rose grew up mastering the art of doggedness, a concern for concentrated clockwork routines, her family and cooking. And as for me, I went to work on the piano, becoming a young woman who played, I'm afraid to say, like I was cleaning linoleum. Of course, I got my associate diploma from the Royal Conservatory of Music, and I played a solo piano recital exercising the very same discipline that would carry me through law school into a career that became <clears throat> my daily bread for over 30 years. <clears throat> a career I rarely loved. You work and work and work. And sometimes the work is excellently done. But then one day you feel spoken in your bones, a word, dust. Forgiveness. Forgiveness, like faith or love, cannot be willed. I know intellectually that unless I forgive my sister and myself for the pain we inflicted on our mother with our quarreling, I will never be free. I also do not recognize myself, a normally compassionate person, in the lack of compassion I feel for Elizabeth. If I permit myself even a scintilla of softening toward her, I'm afraid I might be sucked back into the vortex for collateral, self-serving reasons having nothing to do with true forgiveness or love. My rational self tells me to protect myself as I try to protect our mother. My soul self tells me that unless I love my sister, 
as myself. I'm damned. Sometimes I worry about what might happen if her husband dies before Elizabeth. What if she reaches out to me for help? Whether it be to drive her to the hospital or just to get her out of the house, how could I refuse her? And then I remind myself of how she told me the only reason she required me to visit the assisted living facilities, nursing homes, all the alternatives for our mother was that she doesn't drive. Otherwise, she'd have done it herself. She'd have done everything herself. She hated to need me in any respect. Rose, she needed emotionally. Elizabeth could not comprehend Rose's rejection of her, Rose's pushback for all the unwanted help and intrusion in the aftermath of Rose's husband's death. That was the year before our father died, followed three years later by mum's death. As Rose had tried to mourn Carl in her own way, on her own terms, Elizabeth and Louis just arrived unannounced to take charge of it all. Today, we're going through Carl's clothing. No, we are not, Rose answered. I'm packing up Carl's clothing when it suits me, not on your timetable. But Elizabeth didn't get that. Elizabeth saw her impositions as acts of charity, gifts, the rejection of which left her bewildered and angry. How could Rose, after all I've done for her and the kids? Me, she'd hated from birth. Nothing I could say or do would ever surprise Elizabeth in its capacity to betray her. Compassion is an exercise. So I force myself to contemplate the uncomfortable. I force myself to remember the day that Elizabeth and her husband showed up at her mother's condominium unexpectedly when Rose and I were there together with mom, happy in each other's company, as we went about whatever it was we were doing, Rose dusting or sorting laundry, me working on those banker's boxes full of Bernie's financial disclosures. Elizabeth and Louis didn't call up from the intercom in the lobby. They never did. Our mother hated the way they would just arrive unannounced while she might be on the toilet having a bowel movement, humiliated at their unexpected arrival without the courtesy even of a knock. As usual, they used the fob to get into the building and when we heard the key scratching in the lock, Rose and I froze. Do you know what it's like, Elizabeth said, to walk into a room and hear your own sisters go silent? Elizabeth wiped the table clean. Roughly, she seized each one of my banker's boxes and piled them against the wall nearest the door and then put the kettle on for tea, opened the refrigerator door and began a noisy decluttering, tossing full containers into the garbage without concern for recycling the jars or knowing if the contents were today's meal or yesterday's leftovers, throwing out everything except what she herself had made. What could anyone say? I feel for my daughter, Mum had said. She's my daughter and I love her. It hurts me to think of her dying alone. Some two years after our mother's death, I have a dream that we are all around Elizabeth's last bed, including our mother. She has the comfort of the pure oxygen at her nose, the identical clips Elizabeth had sought to reinsert into our mother's nostrils. In the dream, our mother pulls the tubes away from Elizabeth and says shockingly, I want her to feel what I felt. I want her to know what it felt like, even as I lay dying to be forced against my will. 
Mum would never have said such a thing. She was incapable even of thinking it, forgiving as she was unto death. I know she meant well. I know she really thought that what she was trying to do was all for the best. I remember. What do you think this move to Mountain Vista Village is going to give her? A couple of weeks of joy? And if it had given her even the possibility of joy, would there have been any harm in that? Was it not worth the try? What if the move to Mountain Vista Village was something our mother had wanted for herself? Why did it have to be Elizabeth's preferred choice? That's a choice she'll get to make for herself. Or maybe she won't. Maybe that's what the dream was all about, telling me more about the dreamer than the subject of the dream. Maybe I wanted Elizabeth finally to have some insight into what it was she had done. So I can't reach out to her knowing she'll never reciprocate, knowing that she needs to cling to that sense of herself as always right. And that will be her comfort in her hour of death. She will go down with two fingers in the air, forgiveness with help from us both, from the only ones who can truly give it to each other. Marijuana. At the beginning of the year of her death, when my mother could still climb stairs and spend time with me at my home, Mum sat in front of the fireplace watching Netflix and I made our meals under her tutelage. Sometimes she peeled garlic or asparagus. She said she would love to be a sous chef, that she enjoyed peeling and chopping. Mum couldn't sleep, couldn't evacuate her bowels, and was in constant pain. Every joint, no appetite, in psychological distress. When I recount these symptoms to a dentist at a dinner party, his recommendation? Marijuana. Elizabeth, operating out, her, out of her silos of seized authority and acting as gatekeeper to Mum's doctor, was horrified as was her doctor. So I asked my son, with whom I'd had battles over this very issue in his teen years. The result? Cookies appeared with instructions from an unnamed nurse based in Ottawa. Quarter cookie, three hours to take effect, eight to wear off. I told mom I wouldn't give her anything I wouldn't try with her. She was good for the game. Along with almond stuffed fresh figs wrapped in bacon, I served us the cookies. All I remember is our discussing whether it would be better to die fully conscious of what is happening or to die from... At one point, I couldn't remember how to end the sentence. I think you're drinking too much wine, Mum said. Marijuana. We began to laugh. My son came to dinner and found his Nana and Mama giggling like schoolgirls. Amazed, he watched us gobble up dinner. Then his Nana retired to the washroom for another marijuana-induced event. On the ride home, my mom said, my son said he had some joint pain playing too much squash, and I told him he should get himself into a jacuzzi with salts, but not just any salts, salts from the Himalayas. And on and on, obsessively, I went on about Himalayan salts until Mum said from the back seat, I think you got the bigger piece of the cookie. At the door of Mum's condo, as I kissed her goodbye, she said, it's too bad. It has to wear off.
Thank you, the Canada Council, the Ontario Arts mm -hmm. Council, the Writers Union of Canada, the Italian Canadian Writers Association, and Accenti Magazine for hosting this event. Lisha Canton for moderating, Maria Piespada Fora for your insightful translation, which helped inform the original, and Barry Callahan of Exile for editing and teaching me as we work together at breakneck speed on dying times just before and at the end, at the beginning of the pandemic, which has delayed its publication. But I especially want to thank you, my audience, who have come all the way from Denmark, Florida, Vancouver, Montreal, Winnipeg, Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie, North York, Etobicoke, all parts of Italy from north to south to celebrate what makes us human, the love and need of story, to tell them to each other, to listen to them, to leave them behind. Thank you for listening. Maria Pia. First of all, I want to thank you, you Darni Madat, for giving me the opportunity to translate the excerpt laundry. Thanks to Licia Canton and the Association of Italian Canadian Writers, they have made this encounter between Darlene and me possible. Last but not least, thank you to family and friends who have been here for me. Grazie a tutti. Spero che il brano da me tradotto in italiano abbia suscitato in voi le stesse emozioni che è suscitato in me la prima volta che l'ho letto in inglese. Grazie. And now to your questions. I hope you've identified yourself uh, by place, if not by name. Over to you, Lisha, to let well, me know. Thank you so much, Darlene and Maria Pia. We are looking forward to reading the book and the Italian translation. So we're now taking questions. Send them to the host using the chat feature. Uh, questions can be for our author, Darlene Madot, and for our translator, Maria Pia Spadafora. In the meantime, maybe Darlene, you can tell us when we can expect to see the book in print, available for purchase? That's a million dollar question. I only know that it will be in 2021. Um, I've seen it in page proofs. I haven't yet seen the cover. And... Uh, Hopefully, uh, Michael Callahan can uh, let me know after this event. I hope he's watching. Yes, he is. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, how it worked with the translation, how, how you and Maria Pia worked together. Did you do it on Zoom? Did you do it via email? What were the uh, pleasures and the difficulties of the translation process? Well, Maria Pia was just a joy to work with. We did it on Zoom. Um, Maria Pia would send me, um, uh, well, not initially, the first meeting, she, sent, uh, she worked through it with me and gave me options, choice. Uh, what a pleasure that is, and explained the subtleties of, uh, of each of the choices. And together, we, well, I always deferred to her uh, her greater abilities, I don't speak Italian, and I, uh, you know, other than the odd phrase, um, and uh, so I deferred to her, but she would explain in great detail uh, the subtle differences between each of the options, and then, uh, and then would send me her draft, and then we had, uh, I think, one or two more meetings uh, uh, to go over the, the subtle permutations. It was just a joy. And in one case, I, I changed the English um, to accommodate uh, a, a depth that she had perceived that I didn't know was there. So yeah, it was, it was a fluid moving back and forth and the translation really did inform the original. Maria Pia, do you want to add to that? Uh, well, uh, when Darlene asked to translate this excerpt, I was a little bit scared because an excerpt starts of a whole work and you can miss always something. Uh, but she provided me with the context, which was wonderful. And through several, these several meetings that we had, uh, we, have, we figured out all the difficulties that uh, 
um, I encountered. But in terms of difficulties, um, I think it, the most difficult thing was to maintain the fluency of the narration. In order to do that, I had to make some little changes concerning structures um choice of different verbs or nouns but we already we made it well pretty well i think thank you we have a first question from rosanna uh darlene what is the easiest thing about writing for you and the hardest thing there's nothing easy about writing for me <laughs> I think the hardest thing is overcoming my own fear, my own sense of complete inadequacy before the blank page, inadequacy to the subject, and especially a subject like this one. Um, it was terrifying. And, um, and part of the fear is a fear of offending um, even if, even if you're not writing, well, you're not writing, this is fiction. People recognize themselves or think they recognize themselves because if you're writing something universal, it's got everybody in it. <laughs> We're human beings. So, um, there's that fear that has to be overcome. There's something there are a lot of things I really needed to say in dying times. And, um, and I felt a huge responsibility to the love of my subject. Uh, you know, the people, the people that I knew um, who were experiencing this. And, um, and, and, you know, and I actually have a question for my audience because um, and, and feel free to email me afterward if you want to keep this private, but I really know, need to know how you responded to this. I steered away from some of the, some of the really tough stuff. Um, uh, but for example, um, when uh, the narrator is witnessing the white eyes, um, she has a track record of seeing other eyes you know, as, as they're nearing the end. And, um, and this is not in this part, um, but the character of Jack, uh, there's another dialogue where, where the narrator tells Jack, you're nowhere near the end, Jack, you know, <laughs> because he wants like something yesterday. But, um, uh, but, you know, when you have borne witness to something, you have a responsibility to be true to what it is that you have seen. But ultimately, it boils down to being your own reality. And, um, but you have a responsibility to be true to that reality. And um, the penny has to drop. I'll tell you, there's nothing like reading a thing out loud to know if you've made, if, you're, if, you know, if it rings false. I highly recommend Zoom for anyone who wants to test out something. You've got, you've got, it takes a lot of guts to hear yourself. Darlene, a question from Linda who wants to know if you ever forgave Jack for expecting you to work while your mother was dying. I did. And my mother, actually the true, my, the real mother forgave the, uh, I guess, the role model of Jack. Uh, she, my real mother, knowing how hard I was working on a huge case for him, actually said to, to me, I wish I could give, I'll use the word Jack, I wish I could give Jack what's left of my life. I told Jack that because my mother thought that my senior partner had more important things to do and if she could have extended his life by giving her what was left of hers, she would have done that. That's how self-sacrificing my mother was. But I did forgive Jack because he couldn't help himself. Um, and he also truly believed, and this was his truth, 
that work, work, um, you know, purposeful living is the only way you get through the final chapter. Uh, and uh, so Jack believed that he was helping me. And that, you know, in that final chapter consists of watching those who you love may be preceding you on that journey. So I, I believe that Jack thought like Elizabeth, like the Elizabeth character, that what he was doing was all for the best, including all for the best for that narrator, that she had to, she had to work, she had to serve. We all have to serve. So Jana writes, it's a very personal story and are you presenting it as fiction or a memoir? No, I'm presenting it as fiction because it is definitely fictionalized. Um, and uh, it is a personal story. I mean, I have lost my mother um, and I have lost my senior partner and I did not enjoy in the last years of my practice. So uh, those are uh, certain similarities, but there are a lot of departures, um, you know, and a lot of invention in this. It is fiction. And, and it, and it's fiction because fiction allows you to be true, to be real in a way that a memoir doesn't allow you that freedom. I mean, this is, this is a, this is a real act of freedom busting out of the cage cages all cages for me and um uh when when you read the book you'll see that there's a, a i mean it takes you takes you beyond death and um and into quite uh, i won't call it fantasy because for me it's real the whole thing is real but it's fiction okay thank okay. you Donna. it's fiction that is clear um, a question from Anne um, for Darlene and Maria, Maria Pia. How did you connect and uh, have you ever met in person? Are there any plans to meet in person? You can meet at my house if you like. Thank you for asking this question. I am so grateful to the AICW and it particularly Leisha Canton who started something called Shut Up and Write on Thursday morning. So for three and a half, four and a half because I start early hours we shut up and we write uh, we have the Pomodoro method 25 minutes of writing and five minutes of chit chat and Maria Pia Spadafora was on shut up and write and we discuss lots of things and and also um, Leisha suggested Leisha is a great stage manager she suggested that I get Maria Pia to translate um, part of dying times because we wanted to, I didn't want to be completely solo on this platform. So, uh, and I wanted to be with someone young mm -hmm. and, and, and a different voice. And I wanted to hear the music of Italian. Um, and I, I'm just so moved by that translation and that introduction. So we've gone from there to something else, to another piece, and we're having a lot of fun with it. And um, I hope so at some point, some point to see the whole of dying times in Italian. Thank you. To see. That's how we met. Okay. A yeah. uh, question from Giovanna. Do you have any qualms, personal and ethical, about writing about difficult family relationships with people who are still living? Um, yeah, when people are still living. Do you have any qualms at all? Ethical? Personal? I, I, went through a lot of that in um you and in, in uh, law school i wrote a paper on libel law fiction and the charter of rights and freedom and um and i actually established a standard for when uh fiction crosses a boundary it was like a new standard because if you're writing fiction you don't have the truth defense and you don't have defenses to libel like the public person defense, like if you, you know, you defame a, a public figure. Um, and I also wrote um, an extensive piece which, became, which was used in um, an anthology. At, and it was, I started by calling it Se Brava. It's about the courage to create. 
and it was a, an essay, a companion piece to a piece of fiction that I wrote and was anthologized. Alicia, maybe you remember the name of that. You were in that anthology. It was nine Canadian Italian women writers and it was um, edited by Delia DeSantis and um, Carolyn Morgan. Exploring Voice. What was it called? Exploring Voice, that's right. And that was sort of my um, uh, apologia for writing. And I had to come to terms with it because, um, because a family member who thought he recognized himself in making olives and other family secrets had shut me down for more than a year. And I wrote a letter. I wrote a Dear Bob letter where I answered. And the Dear Bob letter became the basis of that uh, critical essay um, on my apology for writing fiction. And basically, the thesis is that you have to write what you know. And we are all composites of everything we have seen, witnessed, experienced, every connection that we've made with everyone. And um, no one is safe around writers. I mean, I've had my own words uh, used. And I've seen myself in other people's fictions. And it's a very uncomfortable experience. Um, but as my son said, let them write their own stories. <laughs> you know, if, if you want to correct the, right, the record, you write your own story. This is my truth. And I, I have a responsibility to it. Thank you. Uh, Rosanna asks, who or what has inspired you the most to be a writer? Well, I, I wrote my first novel in grade two. And um, I, I'm going to say my mother. Because my mother read stories to us from, the, from before we could speak. Um, she sat with books on her lap every night. And each of her daughters got three books three choices. And one of my favorite stories, which to this day, it's one of my favorite children's stories. It was a story about Chipo, who was, it's a story of an artist who drew cats. He couldn't uh, resist the urge to draw cats. He, they gave him away, the family was starving. They gave him away to the priests to be an acolyte at the temple, but he couldn't resist drawing cats in the margins. Anyway, the long story short, um, it was a compulsion from a very early stage, but I think the compulsion came from appreciating that the story allowed me to travel into worlds that I would never experience, but for the story. It allowed my imagination to roam from the moment I could think, I told myself stories after the lights went out in bed. Um, and, you know, so, and I, to this day, remember the last line of my first novel. It was 41 pages. It was, a, it was about a female pirate on a beach. And the last line was, a shot rang out. <laughs> and I left everyone in suspense about what happened to the female protagonist. But... It, the love of stories was inspired by my mother. She showed me what they could do. Thank you. Um, Terry uh, says that it's very difficult to write about family, especially when it's negative. And the question is, how do you navigate that as a writer? Well, I don't. I close my eyes, I suppose, and I simply wrote. And I, I will confess that I thought I would never want to publish Dying Times. But something magical happens that when the penny drops, when actually, you know, and, I, and I've been writing Dying Times for probably six years. Okay. So, um, so at one point, the penny dropped and I could see the arc of this story that it really really moved in an affirmative direction. And, and it does achieve a forgiveness, it does achieve a reconciliation. And, um, and at that point, when it had become whole, 
and where all the parts seem to coalesce. Uh, I thought, no, I can't, I can't leave this in a drawer. I have to do something with this. This um, deserves to be read by a lot of people. And, and it also contains a blueprint for how to behave around dying people. Like, we get it wrong all the time. I mean, so I thought, I thought this is more than personal. Uh, this is, this needs to ha have an achievement audience. And I also think Jack, the Jack character, gave me permission. Okay. Um, it, it, it was very clear to me. Okay. So anyway. All right. Um, maybe one last question, um, a follow-up to Jenna's earlier question. So uh, are you uncomfortable with the term memoir? And then Jenna writes, in fiction, you say you find the freedom. Does that mean that the truth that exists in real stories and the courage of those who write them do not have the same freedom? So really like a two-part two -part question. It's a fascinating question. Um, I, can you read the first part of it uh, the, for me? Maybe. So the first, the first question was, uh, are you uncomfortable calling your writing a memoir? And well, then, yeah, okay, let me answer that one first. Um, this isn't a memoir. Um, I wouldn't be uncomfortable calling it a memoir if it were a true memoir. Um, that, that doesn't embellish or alter or change the factual truth uh, or move it around because it works better in fiction. Um, I wouldn't be uncomfortable. I think I'm too young to write my memoir. I don't think I've lived enough. I don't think I have enough to say. I don't think anyone would be interested in reading my memoir. I'm not a Barack Obama. I mean, now, and I don't think, you know, and I, I don't think, for example, um, I've been abused in, in any kind of a classic fa uh, or famous way or, or, you know, and I haven't, I, you know, I haven't taken drugs and have something to say about recovery. Like, I think memoir is very important for important people. I don't think I'm important enough. And I think memoir is important if you've got a topic that needs to be memorialized. Um, so I'm not there yet, but no, I wouldn't be uncomfortable with the word memoir. If I, if I, if I became famous and never had something to say, I'm not there yet. And the second part of the question was, so in fiction, you say you find the freedom. This is uh, Jana speaking. Does that mean that the truth that exists in real stories and the courage of those who write them do not have the same freedom? N no, and I am not uh, minimizing in any way people who find the courage to write memoir and call it memoir. I think that takes enormous courage. Like the women who came forward in the Me Too, the beginning of the Me Too, and uh, women who take the stand, enormous courage. Uh, women who testify at rape trials um, and women who write about that. No, I'm not minimizing that at all. Um, again, I'm sort of losing the, um, the whole of that question. There was something else I wanted to say. Do you mind repeating it again? It's a really important question. Okay. Uh, in fiction, you say you find the freedom. It's about it's a question about freedom. Uh, does that mean that the truth that exists in real stories and the courage of those who write them do not have the same freedom? So you are not calling yours a memoir. Uh, is it because you have you because you say you want that freedom? So are you thinking that those who are writing memoirs or real stories do not have that same freedom? Well, I can't comment on um, the sense of freedom that a memoir writer might feel or not feel. I'm, I'm dying to read Barack Obama's book, but um, uh, I imagine that writing a memoir would be far more inhibiting than writing fiction. 
um, I, I wouldn't know where to begin. I mean, what do you do? Do you go to all living people and ask their permission? Do you wait until they're all dead? Which means maybe, because I assume that states can still sue if they want to sue. Um, I, I don't know what you do in that case. Uh, I, it would take enormous courage, but I just know, I only know what I did, what I did, what I do and what I can do. And, um, yeah, you know, so that's the best I can do with that question. Really difficult question. Thank you. I think maybe we'll, we'll, we'll organize a panel about, uh, master writing. <laughs> that would be fascinating. Yeah. Do you have any other comments? That's it for the questions. There are a lot of comments and uh, celebratory comments, congratulations, um, and some private comments for you that you will be reading uh, later on, Darlene, after the event when the chat is being recorded. Um, but if you or Maria Pia have any other comments before we close. Uh, I, would, I would just like to say that I, I don't know what's in the chat, but I, I really would uh, be very grateful to continue the dialogue through emails. Uh, and I'm particularly interested in individual responses because I expect they're going to be quite different. Um, every time I rehearsed, I would think about my audience, who the people I had invited, and I would wonder, I wonder how so-and-so is going to respond to this, or I wonder, oh, is this going to, what's this going to do to this particular person? So this is a huge opportunity for me. I've never been able to reach an audience like this before, and to find out on a one-on-one -on -one level uh, how my individual readers are responding. So I, I look forward to that. Thank you again so much. Um, okay. Um, all right. Maria Pia, do you have any last words? Oh, grazie a tutti, anche <laughs> chi, chi ha partecipato dall'Italia. <laughs> grazie Maria Pia. So thank you again, Darlene Madot, for a wonderful performance. Grazie Maria Pia Spadafora for your wonderful translation. Thank you, Dominic Cusmano, for providing technical support. And thanks to all of you for joining us today. Be safe, be healthy, and happy holidays, everyone. See you at the next event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.